<laughs> howdy, howdy, everyone, and welcome to a fabulous episode of Life Through the Lens. Tonight we have with us Eric Cheng, who is a photographer, a technologist, a cellist, a skeptic, and the director of photography for Lytro, the fabulous camera that we're going to actually get on. Oh. A little bit later. First of all, Anna Nguyen is going to fall off of her chair. See, that's how impressive Eric is. He just knocks people off their seat. So, uh, hi, Eric. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. We're really excited to have you on. So, I thought before um, we we dove in, we'd introduce ourselves. And um, Anna. You <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I was like, a lamp was falling. I'm like, no. Yeah! That was actually kind of, it was like, this is in part, you know, talk show, part action adventure movie. Right. Thank I know you. We, we are talking about underwater photography today. So I'm, yeah. super, I'm super excited to welcome Eric to the show. I'm Anna Wen. I'm a photographer in Naples, Florida. I shoot uh, commercials and or commercials. Ha! I shoot commercial photography, editorial work, and weddings. You can That's find me at you can find me on Google Plus or zanna.com. Fantastic, Eric. We'll come back to you because you know okay. there's just so much to you. We, we can't <laughs> we can't gloss it over. Uh, Carrie Murphy. Hi. I hope I'm not frozen. You're I'm not frozen. frozen on my end, but You're very warm and fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Hey everybody, I'm Carrie Murphy. I'm a photographer outside of the DC area and I co-curate Macro Monday here on Google Plus with Kelly Seeger Kim and Jennifer Eden. And I also do have a website at CarrieMurphyPhotography.com. But you can find most of my recent work on Google Plus. Happy to Fantastic. be here. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, and you also have a little show on Little Galleries. Oh, little Galleries. Hey, little it's gallery. my brother's birthday too, and I'm doing that show with him, so you should go check it out. Yeah. And watch the interview with my brother. My brother. His song. He ain't heavy. Because he's <laughs> brother. Okay. That's right. That's incredibly <laughs> weak and lame, and I really don't apologize for that. That's just a fact. <laughs> Ron <laughs> Clifford. Hi, I'm Ron Clifford. There's my there. Uh, RonClifford.com <laughs> is where you can find me. And on Google Plus. More on Google Plus because that's where I interact with people live like right now. Um, happy to be here. Really happy to have Eric here. Uh, this is just going to be awesome. I love water. I love being on water, in water, around water. Um, uh, so this is just going to be fantastic. Looking forward to it. Yep, absolutely. Tamra Prusner. <laughs> 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 Hi everyone, I'm Tamara Prusner. You can find me mostly on G+. I do have a website, though it's hardly ever updated anymore. It's www.throughtamseyes.com. I am a storm-chasing photographer in Tucson, Arizona. Magnificent, if I may say so. Yes, you haven't fantastic seen lightning, storms. If you haven't seen her lightning photography, you're missing out. I would come to Google Plus and look those babies up because they're amazing. Yeah, thank Tamara you. just thank posted you, thank you. an amazing lightning <laughs> shot she took at sunset, so you have to check it out on her stream. Fantastic. Tana Teal. Hey. Hey. I'm Tana Teal. <laughs> I'm Tana Teal. I'm going to say that twice just because it just was fun to say the first time and now it's the second time. I liked it okay, even better the second time. time. I promise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I oh, am a photographer in Washington, and um, you can find me here on G+, as well as TanaTealPhotography.com. And I finally got my smug mug up and running, so Woo! prints are there. It's mostly Excellent. just print kind of stuff right now, so TanaTeal.SmugMug.com. And I'm super excited to have Eric on the show, too, because I love water. I'm a water baby. <laughs> or, well, I used to be. I just float now. But, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I can't wait to hear all about it. And the Lytro, I, I'm excited to learn about the Lytro because I I played with that one when we went to Portland for the PDX photo walk for the little, for the little gallery opening. And um, I was miserable at it. So I can hardly wait to learn more about it. <laughs> That's awesome. And I am Karen Hutton. You can find me, as you can see, here below at KarenHuttonPhotography.com. I also do voiceovers professionally at KarenHutton.com. My special project is Lil Galleries, as they've been talking about. Isn't that amazing how they mentioned that? Totally unprompted by me. Um, at LilGalleries.com. <laughs> That's L-I-L Galleries.com. And I'm beyond excited 
to introduce to you, if you don't already know Eric Chang, you're going to learn things about him you never knew before. I'm really almost more curious about the skeptic part, though. <laughs> know, we know about the underwater part, you know, Lytro, but skeptic, what is that all about? Do you want to know right now? I do. Well, just <laughs> right now. I'm right kind of curious. It's, it's burning. It's burning a hole in my mind. I can't continue until I know. Why are you a skeptic? Uh, because I live in the real world, and <laughs> well, that it. you know, and um, I, I don't know. I think it's healthy to be skeptical, and um, but you know, not have it drag you down so you're miserable. That's awesome. So I think there's a really good um, balance there. Yeah. You have a wonderful voice, by the way. <laughs> really, it is very uh, it's nice. the microphone, really. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can tell you firsthand the microphone really doesn't help that much. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Eric, you, like I said, you're a photographer, you're a cellist. I, I only recently learned that you're a cellist, which is kind of blew I my love mind. That. In, in, I know, in addition wow. to everything else. How did all this start? Like, what. What were the beginnings of Eric Chang? Like, when did you start taking photos? When did you start playing cello? What? Ah! Explain yourself, young man. Uh, well, my parents were first-generation immigrants from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. That pretty much explains the music part. <laughs> sort of, you automatically uh, have to play at least one one instrument. Uh, so I was. Started, I get sympathize. I get sympathize. Yeah. So I was started. Um, I started piano when I was very young, uh, and then after about a year, I, I really wanted to play the cello for some reason. I have no memory of why, other than uh, that one of my very good friends played, and um, I thought it was it was cool. So, um, so I started playing the cello, and uh, most of my early life, I guess, outside of academics and um, you know what I did after school for a living, uh, was dominated by music, and so pretty much all I did was was play music. You know, I did played little concerts, did a lot of chamber music. I toured with, um, you know, very small orchestras. Uh, and I was kind of a software guy, you know, I studied computer science. Um, and the photography part came in very late in life. Uh, so I was um, a hobbyist photographer, so I always had a, um, a camera of some sort around me. Um, I think, you know, my dad had this little manual Pentax that I learned to use. Um, very early on, I think starting from about fifth grade, you know, I started using that camera. And so I always understood how to take a picture, um, but I never had any inspiration. So as a result, I have lots of pictures of my friends and sort of the things around me. Um, and so it wasn't really until uh, very, very late that I, um, that I became a photographer. And, um, you know, I was, I was in my 20s and um, kind of lost in a software job. Uh, which was fun in many ways, but also something that just didn't um, grab me, you know, emotionally or from the heart. You know, I was playing music outside of work, and which was giving me everything I needed in that area. Um, did you want? I mean, not to interrupt you, but did you want to do music professionally? Was that the idea, or did you just love it and you just wanted to play for the love of it? I, I loved it, and uh, I mean, after all the early part, you know, where you're forced to do it and you hate it, and um, <laughs> and you get over the hump, and I started really enjoying it kind of when I was a teenager, you know, kind of uh, 15, 16, I started really enjoying it. All through college, I, I played very seriously, um, and I think uh, at some point, I could have gone the professional route had I really focused and practiced a lot, And um, but that that time period sort of expired, you know, and, and also like anything else, I mean, photography is the same way. Once you devote your life to it professionally, it changes, the, very, the nature changes a lot. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are, are musicians and some of them are very good and have been successful, but others are very good and have not been successful financially. Um, and it's, it's very painful to watch people in the arts struggle who are really, really talented. Um, so I really enjoy music the way I do it now. Um, it's, fantastic and I get to just enjoy it um, and I'm only worried that in the long term you know there will be a day where I feel like I can't play well enough to enjoy it and then at, at that point I guess I'll have a decision to make. <laughs> I think you're a little ways out there. Are you still playing? Yeah, yeah uh -huh. and in fact um, after joining Lytro uh, I'm traveling much much less and so I'm actually playing a lot more. Um, <gasps> we right. just have nice. recordings? I mean are there places <laughs> you or YouTube or something? I you know I don't know there there is at least one recording of me out there, um, but it's not something that I that I 
do that publicly, I guess, aside from performing. Um, I don't actively record myself and, and put it out there. <laughs> I don't think performing is kind of public. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where do you perform? Um, it really depends. I mean, I, I get pulled into various gigs from uh, by friends who are who are playing uh, professionally, and uh -huh. um, uh, and these days it's it's really in the summers when I get to play a lot. I do a chamber music workshop at Stanford every summer, run by some of my good friends, um, and you know it's like ten days of intensive rehearsals and a performance at the end, um, and you know the occasional house concert as well. Oh, that's um, really cool. My husband's a bass player. He plays gigs, uh, gets called into gigs, just jazz or, you know, clubs or concerts or whatever, just here and there, you know. And sometimes they're recorded and sometimes they're not. So it's probably kind of the same thing, only the classical variety. Yes, the classical variety. <laughs> I posted a picture of, um, who was it? Bo How do you say his name? Bocciarini? Baccarini. Baccarini, yeah. <laughs> and that was when I found out you played the cello because you oh, said yeah. the last... The last thing you played for school, or what was it that you played? Yeah, it was my audition, my my college admissions audition tape. <laughs> so what, what <laughs> were you going, anything, What yeah. were you going for in college that you needed to do an audition tape? Uh, well, I mean, I didn't have a, a major in mind when I applied, so I just included one. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. It just is something you do. do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is part of what I do, and and here's a, here's a tape. That's awesome. That, that's so awesome. I I'm so it. amazing. I not only do this. Exactly. <laughs> it's really, please accept me. <laughs> I do all these things. Oh. I'm multi-talented. Don't you understand? <laughs> See, that's why I left this book in place. It is the art of the Italian Renaissance, because our connection over music is Boccherini. When I, whom, the, the statue that I, that I took a picture of was in Italy. So, we have the crossover of the Renaissance and Italy, and you are a, a really, truly a Renaissance man here in this modern age. So, oh, thank you. I just love the dovetailing of things. So, <laughs> okay, okay. So, take us on the rest of the journey. You did the music, and then you started doing photography for fun. Photography was for fun. Um, I, I guess I, what I did, what, what I was missing was inspiration in photography. So. I really enjoyed I, cameras. I, I liked cameras. I liked that they could take pictures. <laughs> um, but, I love um, that about cameras too. <laughs> yeah, so I always had a camera, but I guess I, would, I didn't really know uh, what to do with it. And, um, and it really wasn't until around 2001 when I, I was working at a little software startup in, in Silicon Valley, and um, I just felt... Uh, like I wasn't doing what I was meant to do. And I felt like I could do it, and the people around me were fun to work with. They were all really smart. Um, and, uh, and I just I started traveling a little bit. You know, I was a little bit lost, um, still working, and went um, on a trip to... I climbed Kilimanjaro. Um, oh, my God. Oh, and it was, wow. Yeah, and it was really... It was sort of on a whim. What are my friends... What are my friends... Whim. Whim. <laughs> And she, so she said, hey, we should climb Kilimanjaro. And I thought, uh, okay, that, oh, that sounds great. Wow. And, then, um, and then she backed out, and I went anyway. Oh, my God. Excellent, Bill. <laughs> um, and I took a camera with me. And, in fact, none of my luggage arrived. Uh, so I didn't have anything except for what I was wearing and a camera and, uh, and a journal. Probably made the hike up quite light. Wow. When we had a camera. It was yeah. brutal because it's rainforest at the bottom. I didn't have waterproof stuff. I didn't have hiking shoes. Oh, wow. um, and every day I thought, and they would tell me every day, the guides, oh, don't worry, your luggage is going to follow you up the mountain tomorrow. <laughs> okay, that's great. And, um, and uh, so I just kept going and uh, eventually made it to the top and um, took a bunch of pictures, you know, and went on the cheapest safari I could find after. It was like $100 a day. And um, took a bunch of pictures and I thought, ah, travel photography is a lot of fun. Um, and I didn't know people actually did it, you know. For, for a living. I mean, I knew, but it never occurred to me that, that I could do it. Um, but And it wasn't really until I went underwater. I went on a dive trip. I was a hobbyist scuba diver, so I had like 20 dives or maybe even less over six years. And, um, and, and, and I thought, I should go on a dive trip. You know, I, I love the water. I love uh, marine life. And um, I, I had kept uh, uh, saltwater reef tanks. Uh, so I, you know, I was fascinated by corals and, you know, how that whole ecosystem worked. Uh, and so 
I, I went to Palau um, with a friend, and uh, again, didn't know there was a there were people actually taking pictures underwater. I mean, you know, I knew I saw them in magazines, but I didn't really know much about it. Certainly, wasn't connected to that industry. Um, and I uh, asked a friend to come with me who was not dive certified, so he had to then get scuba certified. And we hopped on this boat for a week in Palau, and almost literally, literally on my way there, I I bought a um, a housing for my Nikon Coolpix. So this little digital camera that it was the Coolpix nine uh, nine ninety, you know, that with the little a swivel. Little camera. Yeah, I love that thing. And I bought a housing for it with a strobe, and I had no idea what I was doing. And there are all these funny pictures of me with all this stuff like on the on the bed in my cabin, trying to put it together. And then the housing didn't work, and I'd go down past thirty feet, and all the buttons would press in, so I had to ascend to change change settings. Um, and I have a lot of pictures from that trip that are all still online. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Wow. Do you have any of your underwater photos? Handy, whether they're those from then or from now, just I do, yeah. And we, maybe and we you can show, show some of those yes. as you're as you're talking yeah. about this. Bring them sure. up. I just have to say, I noticed that you're not the kind of guy that hesitates when an opportunity presents itself. Um, you're very matter of fact about, oh, so I just did this, or oh, yep. so I did that. You know, for most of us, I, I mean, I'm no. speaking for not just me, but I am pretty confident I'm speaking for more than 80% of the people out there. We're not just, oh, so I did that kind of people. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, um, I, is that just part of, is it natural for you? Is it intentional? Did you have to think about it, or did you just hop into that? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess that's true. I, I don't tend to think too much about the, thing, the, the opportunities that are presented. If it sounds interesting, I just sort of do it. And, um, and I, think, I think anyone can. And in fact, when I first started doing photography, uh, you know, going out and doing these uh, underwater shoots, um, everyone would, a lot of my friends who are still in industry, in the software industry, would say, you're so lucky. And, and that was really sort of grating. Uh, to me, because they were in the exact same situation I was in when I stopped when I started doing it, and you know they were in very stable jobs that paid well. They could buy the equipment and travel if they wanted to, and the only difference between us is that they didn't do it. Yeah. And wow. Uh, and you, so, mm -hmm. can you sc go ahead and while you're talking, go ahead and screen share your um okay photos. So these are some to... pictures I have um actually on Google Plus, um, and um, I can show some of these. Um, these are pictures of of sperm whales. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, honestly, the when when this first happened to you, when you first got to be face to face with such a magnificent creature, how do you feel? Well, by this point, I had been in the water with these with big creatures a lot, um, but I remember the first time. One of the first experiences like this um, was with humpback whales in Tonga. And um, actually, the first humpback whale experiences were off, way offshore in Hawaii. Um, and it was mostly just a humbling experience. You know, you have these animals that are, that are, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet long, and they choose to have an encounter with you. You know, you, you are not going to get close to these things unless they want you to get close. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and also we're on, we're on permit and you're actually not allowed to harass them. So you have to shut off your boats at a certain distance and then um, kind of hop in the water and hope they come to you. Um, you know, so all of these encounters uh, leave you with a feeling of privilege, you know, like you were chosen to have this encounter with, with this animal. Um, They're so, wow. The images are actually emotionally overwhelming. Definitely. That's what I was going to say. I mean, I can only wow. imagine being there. I'd probably <laughs> the start time. bawling and drown myself in my equipment. You know what I, I, re I really love about, about your underwater photography from the underwater photography that I admire is that you actually, I mean, it's yours is like almost kind of like ne not necessarily true underwater, but I'm so used to seeing, you know, portraiture or stage mm. photos underwater. I'm not used to seeing like nature. Animals in their animals. element. Life. Yeah. And people interacting with these animals, like yeah, yeah. You know what's interesting is uh, at least on Google Plus, the the underwater pictures that are mo the most popular tend to be pictures of people, mm -hmm. people in pools, people you know in very clear water. Um, but in the underwater photography community, they they are in the vast minority. You know, right. they they just we don't overlap that much, um, and most of that kind of photography uh, is centered around the genre of 
women with flowy things on underwater, <laughs> um, you know, with dramatic lighting. And there is certainly a market for that. Um, but the market, I mean, the, the opportunities for um, opportunities to to have experiences with wildlife uh, in the in the ocean in the wild are 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 really amazing. And you know, Karen, you talked about you know that you might start crying in that situation. That's really what it makes you feel like. You know, mm -hmm. you I, I had this huge lump in my throat. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, there's there's really there's really no way to describe the the power of that moment. Um, that's what happens to me in nature, you know, when it's just so big and overwhelming and just the sheer design of, you know, whoever made this, the universe, and it's just so big and so beautiful and like that. I mean, I would just and be sobbing. Connected. It's the connection, I think, too, that gets me like, whoa, I'm part of this. <laughs> I remember my first snorkeling trip and I had like this kinky little like one-time use underwater film camera and I was so intimidated by by just the ocean and being so close to these animals and, and, and swimming through a school of fish that I didn't take that many photos. <laughs> like, how do you, how did you oh get God. over your initial, like, like, shock of, like, for lack of a better word, like, oh my God, this is amazing. I need to, I need to capture this. Well, my, um, my, my diving, you know, becoming a, a good diver and, an underwater photographer happened simultaneously for me. So I, I was really never a diver without being a photographer. Mm -hmm. And so it, it wouldn't really even occur to me to dive without a camera. And in fact, in the, in the rare situations in which my camera has stopped working for some reason, I'm, I'm barely in the water. Um, and so I feel like the diving part is really just, it's like a walking, you know, you have to get to your destination to take a picture. And, um, That's incredible. Oh my God. So these, this, yeah, this, this <laughs> is actually a giant um, sea fan, a Gorgonian. Um, and it's probably, I don't know, it's like 14 feet across. Oh. And, um, and this is just the silhouette of this amazing kind of fractal, fractal That's colonial amazing. life form. Yeah, it's a, it's a coral. It's so are good. these, you're taking these, are, are these still taken on the cool pics or is this, what camera are you using for this then? No, no, these are, um, various forms of Canon SLRs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started uh, shortly after the cool pics, uh, I shot when I started getting serious. Um, my first underwater camera was a Canon D30, uh, so a three megapixel SLR, uh, and then a D60, and then I went full frame to a one DS and kind of um, you know kept kept that upgrade cycle going, that three year professional upgrade cycle from the on the one series. Um, and these shots here, like this shot, is unusual because it was shot with um, with a really bizarre lens uh, and I posted some of these pictures to my uh, Google Plus profile before but um, this is with a um, it's, it's almost like an endoscopic lens it's a, a very it's a long tube with a very small fisheye element on the end and there are a bunch of relay lenses inside that shove the light down the pipe to a macro lens uh, and so you can get really really close you can shoot fisheye from you know basically touching the lens and so you can get these kind of bizarre. This is what that coral looks like. It's a leather coral. It's a very plain coral. It's a kind of coral that people just swim by because it's just brown, leathery thing. How and, big is that? Can I ask? Yeah, it's like uh, maybe eight inches high or something. Oh wow! Oh wow! So one thing that this lens does is exaggerate. It, you know, it, it you lose a sense of scale because you're now right. looking at these things from from the perspective of you know a small animal. Oh, my there now, is. do you also learn, like, from your scuba diving, you also learn about the animals that, are, that you photograph, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, this one's one of my favorites, shot with that same lens. Uh, again, these, these corals are corals you would just swim by, and they, you can, you know, have these kind of magical environments if you really study them. Is that um, available light, or do you have a strobe on? No, these are all strobe. Anything where you see color <laughs> is strobed. So we carry um, two, well, I carry two strobes on articulating arms attached to my big rig. And you, so every shot is, it's like you carry a mini studio with you. So every picture you have to decide where are your two lights going to be, what power they're on. And we shoot manual everything underwater. Um, I, sorry, Anna, what was your question? You, I totally forgot. Oh, I, no, I think you answered it. I just asked, um, yeah, if you, that's, yeah, you answered it. <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. So, tell me about so, identifying the, the, the Oh, um, yeah, the marine, the biology, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. These, you know, the animals underwater, all the little critters, all, um, 
they all want to get away from you. <laughs> that's pretty much their goal. You know, you see this giant thing coming towards you that's making a lot of noise. You know, this, the scuba diving is, you know, these bubbles are, are really, really loud. Um, and they just want to get away. So understanding um, behavioral biology or having a behavioral biology education is absolutely essential to, to being productive underwater. How did you get that? Did you go to school for that or just somebody taught you or? No, if you just, I mean, you spend enough time in the field with, with people who have decades of experience and you just absorb it through them, you know, and, uh, and, and I think people learn this stuff differently because if, you know, if you iterate and have a very tight feedback loop for learning, mm -hmm. this underwater photography is much easier because you, know, you take a picture, it doesn't work, and there are all these variables you can change and you might as well just change them right there. But of course, some people will make the same mistakes kind of over and over again for 30 years. Yeah. Um, and it's much hard, harder for them, I think, underwater um, you know, than it is if it's just certainly shooting on digital has helped a lot. Oh now, you, my God. you were mentioning, you were mentioning you that you uh, have a, a community of people that do this type of underwater work. You were comparing them to, say, a Google Plus's community that appreciates more of the pictures of people and portraits, something they connect more with. Um, that community that you, you're you kind of building, is that like a kind of a worldwide thing? Because obviously you must travel a bit to get this variety of work. Yeah, it's a worldwide community. Um, I mean, one thing about underwater photography is that there aren't very many people doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I run a site called WetPixel. It's wetpixel.com. And it, it is a community website for underwater photographers uh, that started out as as something I did for fun and ended up being income generating and kind of enabling uh, for me as a photographer. Um, and um, what I like about it is that I get the feedback makes it worth running. You know, a lot of people are literally the only person who takes underwater photographs in their entire town. Wow. And, you know, right. they have to come online for community. So, you know, there is a very strong network, global network, but the only places we meet are online or in the field. Um, and, um, you know, there's a tremendous appreciation. Like this picture here, this is this is a squat lobster in the folds of a giant barrel sponge, and it was shot with that endoscopic lens I was talking about. This picture probably has no commercial value. You know, you would never see this in a U.S. dive magazine because it can't be used to um, to sell advertising for the resort that's next door. You know, nobody cares about this weird little lobster thing, um, but we do. You know, and so one of the goals of Wet Pixel, and one of the reasons that we we published a magazine for two years is that we really wanted the pictures that were interesting in our domain to be shared no matter what commercial value they had. Um, and so that was a really important thing. Uh, this is one I shared on Google Plus just um, earlier today. Um, wow. The slugs are the, you know, some of the prettiest things underwater. They're, that is amazing. It so almost looks like a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. They're incredibly colorful. Uh, things that are very colorful underwater tend to be uh, venomous or poisonous right, right. and um, and the other thing is if something is red it's trying to hide because there's no red light underwater oh my you know, god so, oh wow so you know, we, you know, I, I just want to mention I, I live in Canada in Ontario and there's an area north of me uh, off Tobermory that is considered the dive capital of Canada I certified as a scuba diver there 22 years ago and I have one dive after that under my belt. Not because I don't enjoy diving. The water is extremely cold. I was going to say, it's cold, right? You have to wear a full, a full quarter inch wetsuit all the time in all seasons. So it's very restrictive. And even with light, everything is blue-green. Um, so I, unfortunately, I, I have to disagree with you there. Um, <laughs> the, 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 you know, this north, nor, you know, this northwest Pacific coast all the way up to Alaska is some of the co most colorful uh, coastline underwater you can find. And if you take light and you get closer, it looks blue green until you get very close, and then suddenly everything is red, orange, yellow, I tremendously know. colorful. It's water maybe not, not where I go in freshwater. It's oh, you're talking about freshwater. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Where we are is freshwater. Now there are there are over 150 shipwrecks in the area, so that's mm -hmm. interesting. But I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what you're doing. <laughs> right. Well, you know, if you if you head over to the west coast and you hop in the ocean uh, in in BC or up in Alaska, it is some of the most productive water on the planet. Let me and just book my ticket now. Hold on. Yeah, you should go. It's <laughs> incredible. I mean. British Columbia is kind of like the center of cold water diving, you know, in this region, and uh, it's it's lush. I mean, you you know, in a typical reef, if there's current, 
we try to put one finger down to stabilize ourselves on a dead part of the reef. And wow, literally when I was in that area, especially like I actually have done much more diving in Alaska than in Canada, but wow. I would be drifting by these walls looking for a place to put my finger down and I just drift by the whole wall because there's literally not a, a single square inch that is not covered by life. Wow. Um, yeah, so that, that cold water is tremendously productive. Fantastic. Now, I, contrasting that to your work with, uh, you work with Lytro, um, is that a more create? Is that along the creative line or a technological line? Like this, obviously, is very organic and creative. It involves a big community. But um, what about your work with Lytro? This is quite a fantastic um, piece of equipment that's come out. Yeah, the. Um yeah, I, I sort of view my oh, this is not in water. <laughs> Those okay. are amazing. Oh my God, they're beautiful. Yep. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it works. But yeah. before we before before okay. we change to the light trail, before yeah, you yeah. change that okay. and you go away from underwater, I had a question for you. Do you have any shots of how your setup looks like when you're under there doing the really close ups of the really teeny tiny little things? Oh my yes, gosh. I do. Yes. Oh, yes. oh my gosh. Oh. Okay, so Wow. Miniature submarine. It looks like, oh my gosh, you know what that it looks, looks like? That way. Do you guys remember that old the movie? The light. Yeah, it looks like a transformer, basically. Yes. yes. It's yes. an insecticon. <laughs> Short circuit. <Holy. laughs> yeah. Short circuit. So, awesome. This is the this is that uh, that fisheye micro relay lens um, on a housing for a Canon 7D, and I have both strobes and continuous lighting because I'm shooting both video and stills underwater. Uh, so this is as complicated as my rigs get. Um, this is now this is a different. This is me with a, a typical wide angle setup. So this is a, a wide angle uh, setup with uh, you see those articulating arms and strobes on the end, uh, and then I have a GoPro attached to me as well. Oh um, lord! Wow. In the back, so people can see what I'm doing. Wow! Um, oh yes, yeah, right up above you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should we answer this question that's come in? Yeah, actually. Yeah, go, yeah, if you see a question go by and we don't get to it, go right ahead. Yeah, we have um, Aaron Kurt in the chat asked if, uh, as part of your photography, has your work been to assist in the marine research in any way by either photographing an unknown or new species of fish or sea life? Yeah, so um, one of the great things about the, this community at WetPixel is that we have a lot of researchers on there as well. And so I, I view our extended community as a community of, um, of, of field, sort of field scientists, really. You know, we're out collecting imagery from uh, around the entire world. And whenever someone sees something that looks strange, um, usually we can get it to the f sort of foremost expert in, you know, t 15 minutes. I mean, you, they're going to see it and be very interested. Um, and that, that's been really rewarding. So, you know, we've been... Um, involved, you know, mostly in collecting pictures from, from the field. Uh, that breaks down a little bit with cetacean researchers, with whale, research, whale researchers who, um, in my experience, feel a little more ownership over this, their subjects, and so they don't like us in the water uh, with whales. Uh, and it's understandable, but, you know, we're on permit too, so there's not much they can do. Um, yeah, so as much as we can, um, you know, I, I certainly love that aspect of it. Oh, this is not, that's not. That's awesome. Sorry, this scary. is a. Oh, yeah. really scary. <laughs> standing on water. <laughs> yeah, that's not underwater. This is. Wow. Eric, do you have any long-term plans with your underwater photography? That kind Did of goals just... or places you want to be or anything like that? Uh, long-term plans? Yeah. Um, yeah. What are your long-term well, plans? So, I mean, one of the reasons I, I came back to industry uh, to Lytro, and I really feel like Lytro is. I'm returning to industry, you know, the tech tech world, um, is that I, I don't want to be someone who is out taking pictures, taking pretty pictures for no reason. And I've always felt like I, I would much rather be doing this sort of work um, in the context of research or exploration uh, or something a little more than kind of going to a pretty place and taking pictures. And um, Don't and move also, off that photograph. Or finish what you're one, saying. Okay, yeah. And, and also conservation. You know, conservation, I've, uh, this is great that we have sharks here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm involved with an organization called Shark Savers, uh, which is an NGO dedicated to uh, shark conservation, uh, specifically trying to prevent people from finning sharks to eat in shark fin soup. So, um, 
Yeah, so those are the sorts of things that drive me in my underwater work, um, as well as, of course, capturing pretty pictures, but mostly it's to capture them um, so that we can share with, uh, with other people. And, um, you know, the ocean is in trouble, in serious trouble, and uh, these pictures are, are, in some ways, the only way a lot of people can ever connect to the ocean other than destroying it, you know, because you're either going right. to eat seafood and you're going to look at pretty pictures, right? Those are the two ways you interact with the ocean. Um, and so if you can be a little bit smarter about how you eat seafood, and you, I mean us, um, then, you know, that's a great outcome for my work. Wow. So it's really using, you know, using what you do for the power of good and not evil, basically. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Explain this. Yeah. What the <laughs> waha ha. I think there might be more. Here's another one. <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. Gosh. oh, my God. Dude, really? wow. That's incredible. What wow. the <laughs> This, yeah, uh, so, so this, this reaction is great because this is the, the reaction most people have to sharks. Um, and it's a pretty clear indicator that you've never been in the water with a shark. <laughs> or, you know, I'm this thinking, kind of shark. cool, I want to try that. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But these that's are better than storm Do sharks shark sense panic? Like, because I would be panicking. Wait, 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 one question at a time. Let him finish what he's saying because this he was just about to say, what is the deal? Hold on to that, Anna, because I want you to ask that. But, okay, what? What is the deal? So yeah. So these are uh, one of the best places to be in the water with sharks, with big sharks, is in the Bahamas, and this is an area in the West Bahamas where there is a very healthy population of tiger sharks. So these big guys are tiger sharks, and the little guys are lemon sharks here. The little guys meaning kind of six to eight feet uh, long. <laughs> little guys, um, little pets. Yeah, and the big ones, you know, these big tiger sharks can get very, very large. Um, and uh, they're, we, they're, they're baited in by the scent of fish, um, and, and we photograph them. And we have these amazing experiences. You know, they move very slowly um, and are, are just looking for the fish. And so they just do these big, slow loops uh, from down current, and they swim up to you and then turn around and swim up to you again. Um, and we actually know many of these sharks by name and by oh, behavior. Sorry. So, you know, some of these sharks we've been photographing for uh, nearly a decade now. And, you know, you, wow. you watch the shark wow. get pregnant and give birth and come back. It's all skinny. And then, you know, the, wow. the same shark is, and they all have very specific personalities. And so it's really when, when an unknown shark comes in that everyone's on guard, certainly the crew who are there, you know, essentially to make sure that this can be done safely. Um, and, How do they do that? Well, there are very strict rules. Um, Everybody is dressed in black, um, you know. And if you don't have, if you have blonde hair, you have to wear a hood, a dark hood. Um, so you know, nothing, no super bright colors, which could be mistaken for torn flesh. You know, like if a fish is Fresh injured, meat. yeah. If, if a fish is injured, it's it's gonna it's, it's white underneath. And if you want to get bitten by a shark in this in this sort of setting, you know, pretty much you can wear a white glove and wave your hand around. And, That's okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So there's some the rules, though. No. Totally. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh. There are some other rules. You know, stay off the surface. They investigate everything in the surface, so we're on the bottom. Oh, that's or, or why if you're black, they don't think you're a seal as long as you're down there, not down on... low. You gotta go under, the right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and also, of the panic mode, right? Like the first thing you do if you're gonna panic is you're gonna go up, right? Yeah. So you want to go down, straight down, and also face you face these animals. They're you know they're predators. They're gonna approach you from behind. Um, so always this, eye contact is very important. Facing facing the animals is very important. Now, um, now, going back to my my question of can they sense panic or fear? Uh, I I believe they can. I'm not sure that much research has been done. They can certainly sense erratic movements, which propagate through the water very well. So if you're splashing at the surface, you're going to draw every shark in for miles. Um, they have an incredible sense of smell. You know, they might be able to smell urine, which is a typical you know thing people do when they're stressed out. Fear indicator. Um, yeah, fear yeah. indicator, and and so also staying calm is. I mean, if you certainly if you go underwater and thrash around, you will attract the attention of sharks. It doesn't mean they're going to come straight in and attack you, <laughs> uh, but it does mean that they're going to they're going to try to figure out what you are. They're, they're more interested in you. How do they yeah. figure out what you are? Do they kind of nose you? Do they sort of like bump you with their nose, or because I mean, if you have fish smell wafting around you. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, have you had say, any close they call? They take out a little nibble. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they they don't. Um, 
I mean, they do bump. You know, they very frequently bump, and we have these large cameras, which is what they make contact with. Mm -hmm. um, and you just sort of push them away, and they, they go away, um, and they continue their search for, for the fish. Um, so wow. we, we are just very clearly not on their prey list. You know, they don't, they're not looking for us. In this area, there are no marine mammals left, so they're not in the habit of eating marine mammals. Um, you know, they've been hunted to extinction. And, and so they don't really know, I, you know, they're just not interested in you as food. And they, the only thing they would be interested in, uh, the only way they would be interested in you as food is in scavenger mode. You know, if you are uh, a carcass and you're floating for a long time, so it's going to eat you eventually. Right. Um, but they're not going to come after you while you're, you're still alive. There's too much risk of, you know, of getting hurt. People are just blown away by <gasps> this. Are oh, you oh riding that shark? Oh. So I am not riding the shark, but it is going. <laughs> it is going like between my frog. legs. Look at him right under you. you. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> oh. So how many how many other photographers are down there with you? I mean, obviously there's more than just you. Yeah. So this this boat that we're on is called the Shearwater. It runs out of Florida and um, can hold. 10 to 12, I mean, we typically take eight or so. So you might have eight to nine people in the water plus uh, two or three crew, uh, crew members. And, um, and that's nice and small. That's a good, good number. Uh, and of course, not, not everyone's always in the water. So it's usually a handful, right. maybe six people. We like to stagger because, right. you know, as I said, everything just tries to get away from you. So if you dump 12 people in the water. Nothing's left. Yeah, I mean, you're more likely to have things leave. I'm, I have to remember to breathe, and so if I just suddenly, you know, look blank and fall over in my chair because I'm like, <laughs> yeah. can't breathe, I'm like, <gasps> this is... Here's a, this is a shot of, um, of cold water, and oh. Ron, Ron was talking about this. Yeah, I can so, yeah, so we're in a glacial flow in Alaska and in dry suits, Yeah. Um, and uh, it's actually quite warm when you're in a dry suit. Yeah, I, I, I didn't have the pleasure. The, the, the morning I did my certification for open water diving, um, there was one meter waves. We did a shore dive and it was snowing. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's wonderful. Um, is yeah, that a so grouper? That this, photo with you and the... Yeah, this is a... It's a yeah, it's basically a grouper. It's a big Me and my it's grouper. A potato cod. <laughs> a lot of people have groupies. Yeah, always bring some groupers along with it. And then some people have gropers, so it's, <laughs> you have to get it all straight here. Right, oh my god! Right. Pigs. Look at that! Oh my goodness! Oh, let me show this picture pigs before don't they fly. before we move on. Let me show this picture of pigs. Um, there are actually swimming pigs out there, and really, that's fascinating because I was under the impression pigs couldn't swim. Nor well, fly. Here we oh, go. I, I remember seeing that one. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you, Tana. Oh, that's amazing. Oh that is too cute. Now, is this someone's like pig lit, as in they own them, or they're wild? Um, I actually don't know the full story, but there is an island in the Bahamas where, uh, and I, I assume, I mean, I've always been told they're feral, so these are pigs living on shore. And this is actually a piglet that wasn't there the, the year before, but we, of course, saw the male and the female. And this would be exactly between them. Um, and, and they are so used to people there that they swim out to boats because uh, the locals will bring, bring them scraps and feed them. Oh, cool. So when you come in They're on a boat, so cute. yeah, these pigs all come swimming out at you and, and they can swim. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't look like they, they're little, they don't have web feet. It looks like the water would just go through their toes and they couldn't swim anywhere. But they actually oh, motor. They got that big nose to help them. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh my god. Well, maybe it's just they swim kind of the same way dogs swim because dogs don't really have web feet either. Yeah, yeah, they actually, they look very similar when they're swimming. Um, so it's that it's pretty too, funny to I mean it's you could not have more fun. You know, this is this is so much fun to be in the water with pigs. <laughs> I can only imagine like wait. Well, what? See like we we have wild boar and I would never be anywhere near them cuz they're mean. No, yeah, that's right. That's totally right. different. <laughs> Look what you get. I mean, this is, and what is, I mean, I, I can't talk. This is just, <laughs> I swear I to God. Say, it's a rare day that I've seen you without words. <laughs> uh, how about that, right? That's Jeez. amazing. Oops. Yeah. Jeez, Louise. So, okay, so you go with the crew. You're on this boat. You've got this Look gear. Are you guys heart. sponsored? Are you making money doing this? Is this all out of your pocket? Is this out of the goodness of your heart? Like, how does, at, at this point, oh, my God. <laughs> 
how how does this like happen I, on that level? That I want to do that. <laughs> Sharks jump out of the water. They <laughs> do. Um, yeah, sometimes. Um, how, yeah, how so, did you catch this? Like, this is amazing. This, okay, so this is um, it, has anyone seen Air Jaws? On it was on Discovery a long time ago. Yes. Uh, so these sharks are just off of Cape Town. They they jump out of the water when they're uh, doing surprise attacks, ambush the tra or ambushing local seals. Yeah. And um and so if you go there, you can go see them do this and um and try to get a picture. So um, surprise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. cool. Not from yes. underneath. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, is this a great white? This is a great white. Yeah. Do you like swim down there with them like you do tiger sharks, or would you no. try to avoid that at all costs? Um, uh, most great white encounters, certainly for uh, normal divers, are from a cage. Well. Oh, yeah. 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 No, no, they're from cage. Yeah. So you, because they're usually or off, should say often in areas where they're um, surprising marine mammals, and so they're eating. You know, yeah. yeah, there's more of a chance of of a, uh, Bite. you know, well of a. Yeah, certainly, but yeah. I mean, people do go out of the cage with them. You know, we are not on their playlist, but there can be a um, mistaken identity or you know something like that, yeah. which would, has a good chance of being fatal. Well, and especially in this area, right? Because I mean, this area is well known for eating. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, what they that's do right. in this area. They eat. That's right. <laughs> they We've eat. all got <laughs> I This is have. one area I would not get in the water with the great white. This is like shark sushi. I, I'm I good. You, um, the longer I look at this, I have to know when you caught this sequence. Like, were you just like this? Must have been a moment for you. It's a moment for me. <laughs> like, yeah, it was um, extremely tiring because you had to hold the camera up for a long time. And this is a this is a Canon 1D Mark uh, oh. two, so it's you know eight eight and a half frames a second. So this this whole sequence is just over one second. And it only happened like this once in four days, and so you have to be ready wow. uh, for the shot. And if you sort of turn away, or you, you know, you take a sandwich break, or, or something. Right. And and actually having that 1D Mark II was perfect because it's totally weather sealed, and it was raining, and um, and I think you know I I have I had so much trust in my camera that I didn't even notice, but I was using my camera to shield my sandwich from the rain. <laughs> and, um, and it took it's crazy. It's awesome. it took someone else pointing it out uh, before I even realized I was doing it. And uh, <laughs> so they're they're amazing tools these days. Um, That's oh, and K Karen, I want to get back to your question about how these trips happen. Right. What I'm doing. So um, in the beginning, I was, of course, paying for my own travel, and I um, would just. Uh, you know, decide I wanted to go somewhere, and, and I didn't do very many of these. And I was I was doing uh, software contract work on the side to sort of fund it all because it's very expensive. Um, and then what happened is uh, I started winning uh, winning photo contests, and mm -hmm. the the underwater photo contests typically have prizes as gifts. Mm -hmm. uh, gifts as prizes. Mm -hmm. right, no, I'm sorry, they're the same thing. <laughs> Trips <laughs> as <Yeah>. prizes. <laughs> the prizes, right? Yeah. So you know, submit to a bunch of contests. If you win one, you get you get a trip. And then you go on the trip and take more pictures, and I, I sort of did that for, for a few years, and it got me to quite a few places around the world, um, which was very convenient. And at the same time, I was developing WetPixel and establishing a name for myself in the industry, um, not through the industry, because if you try to go through the dive and underwater photography industry, you end up being a, you know, um, a dive master, and you you're kind of hauling tanks around, hoping that you can get in the water with the camera. Right. But if you sort of go around it all, it's I think it's much easier, and you know it was a good timing for me as well. And I um, basically ended up being someone that people wanted to dive with. And so uh, through Wet Pixel, I started running trips about about six trips a year, and I would just oh, decide yeah. where I wanted to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then run a trip there, and you know we charter the boat, and it ends up being income generating as a trip, um, and designed to be productive photographically for underwater photographers, right. you know, from the ground up. So instead of being hauled through five dive sites a day, we will sit in one place if it's great, and we'll sit there forever, you know, for days. And you'll teach people, you'll you'll help them learn, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, yeah. To, I mean, as much as they need. A lot of people are already advanced shooters, oh. and they're really there for the, you know, just to be with other good shooters on a trip that's designed to be pro productive. Um, right. 
So I'm less workshoppy in my trips. You know, I don't do as many. Uh, this is a wow. Uh, cuttlefish mm -hmm. and an egg. Baby cuttlefish, yeah. Uh, so I don't do as many of the formal workshops. Um, oh, but mostly because I don't have to. You know, I think if I had to do workshops, I would do workshops. Um, but I can get away with running a trip and, like, and just being there. And, you know, everyone learns from each other, of course, during these trips. Uh, so there are tons of fun. I've made lifelong friends through those trips. Um, and I, I hope to go back to them at some point. Wow. We have a question from uh, Aaron Kirk, who's in New Zealand, actually. He said, for people wanting to explore underwater photography, what would you suggest as a starting point in terms of gear and so on? He dives in New Zealand, but he never thought of taking a camera with him, and he's loving your work, just totally. Yeah, um, it's, it's never been easier to take a camera underwater. You know, pretty much every camera that's made now has some kind of housing you can get uh, maybe, maybe except the Lytra camera. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you got to work on that. Yeah, pretty much every every camera has has some kind of housing, and you know even you can use a GoPro, and that's it's great. It fits in your pocket, and and so you can use any camera. But the most important thing is to address lighting. You know, they're they're just not full spectrum lighting down there. Everything's blue green, as Rob was, say, was saying earlier. So you you definitely need um, definitely need. Uh, strobes for still photography or continuous lighting for video that will bring all the colors out and um, and you can see how it works and everything is very close range you know light doesn't go very far underwater mm -hmm. so you have to shoot you know all the wide angle shots are shot fisheye or very very wide uh, and then the strobes don't go very far right so you have these these giant strobes actually they can only light things up for six feet you know and so you have to be close so I would say lighting is most of it and the camera, you know, doesn't matter until you've outgrown it. And you have to you have know. fast lenses, probably 2.8 or lower? Uh, actually, we don't really need fast lenses because depth of field, we struggle, you know, to get as much depth of field as possible. So mm -hmm. most, most wide-angle shots, certainly if you're shooting fisheye, are shot at, you know, kind of f7.1, f9, f10, and everything's in focus. And, in fact, we'll frequently just pre-focus on our fin and just shoot. Um, yeah. You know, you you going for that hyperfocal. And um, for macro, we have this problem too, right? Shallow depth of field can be used artistically very, very, in a very interesting way. Um, but if you want to capture behavior or the whole animal, you have to stop down. So we're typically shooting wow, awesome. you know, right. F10, into F10 to F16, or you know, we're diffraction limited. Mm. Sounds like a condition. Like yeah, here, exactly. <laughs> where you're shooting part in and part out of the water, you've got strobes underneath and the natural light on top to balance? That's right, yeah. And the, and the, the water line is on the dome port, is on that large optic on the front of the camera. Uh, so you have Do to keep you, it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll ask when you're done with that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the challenge is, of course, keeping the top part of the dome port water-free or shooting through a very thin sheet of water that's shooting off of it. Right. Um, and then... Of course, focus is in a different position uh, on land and in the water, so you need a tremendous amount of depth of field to shoot a split picture in which the bottom and the top are both in focus. Wow. Like F, what, 16 maybe? Uh, it depends on the sensor size. So certainly with full frame, it's much harder. And uh, with fisheye lenses, it's much easier. Mm -hmm. um, and the smaller the sensor, the easier it is. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you do any videos or presentation for school children? About this um, I, I have in the past, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't do it regularly, um, but it's always been a lot of fun. Oh, I am yeah. sure. Oh, my, I, son, I love my son that. was behind me looking at some of your pictures going, what? <laughs> Here with, we put a question. With that last shot, Eric, do you have to do that like in a certain time of day, like midday or just morning or just evening to get that kind of, that, the balance? Or? Yes, the balance, to get the balance right between the underwater and the above water. Yeah, that's actually that's a really good question. Um, I, people have different <laughs> ways of shooting, but I tend to shoot wide angle mostly in the early morning and late afternoon because the sun is so powerful that our strobes have a hard time competing with it. So if you're underwater and you, you want that, you know, your background blue to be nice and dark, maybe you want the sun in the picture, which is hard for digital cameras. Um, but to compete against the sun is very difficult. So I, I tend to like to shoot these when the sun is not at its you know peak or or when it's overcast a little bit. Um, yeah. So as long as you can get, as long as your strobes can fight, compete with the sun, um, 
you can shoot at any time, basically. That's okay. amazing. Uh, amazing. I can imagine when you're learning, you shoot a lot of image images just because of the technical aspect. Of yeah, definitely. You definitely shoot a lot. A lot of experimentation is required, and, and mm -hmm. it, it really favors people who can look at a picture on the back of the camera and learn from that shot. Um, and, you know, I'm, it sounds like a very reasonable thing to, to ask people to do, but it's, strangely, it's not. I mean, a lot of people will shoot an entire dive, um, but shoot the same way the whole dive and come up and all their pictures have the same problem. Oh, no. And, of course, maybe they'll learn in the next dive, right? You can always yeah, learn. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I'm thinking. That would be frustrating. You kind of want to be able wow. to make sure you get something while you're down there. It, it can be yeah. pretty expensive. I mean, some of these trips aren't... aren't exactly, yeah. Get to, so you really wow, want to sure you got your science done. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, the trips are definitely expensive. We could sit here for hours and hours and hours on this, but um, one last question on the underwater portion of our show, because we still have to talk about Lytro. <laughs> okay. uh, for God's sake, um, what is your favorite place to shoot? Oh, oh, boy. Um. Do you have <laughs> one, or do you have places that are your favorite for different reasons? I have places that are favorites for different reasons. That's the best way to put it. Um, so, I mean, by now I've been to most parts of the world underwater. There are a few places I haven't been to. Um, but I, it's very rare that I just go to a place and shoot whatever's there now. Typically, trips are very, very focused. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're targeted. So mm -hmm. the idea is, let's say you want to photograph, well, sharks. This is a good example. You, you go to the places where there are sharks, you know. Mm -hmm. All these whale shark pictures I have, people when you show them to people, they say, I've always wanted to see one of those. And you just ask, have you been to the places where they are? <laughs> and, you know, more, of, more often than not, the answer is no. You know, I, I just hope to see one. Okay, well, I could hope to see lots of Whoa. things, you know. You know, one day, I mean, I hope to see lightning striking over an active volcano, but I'm not going to see it unless I go there, you know. I'm really hoping not to see that right there. <laughs> I want to see that too. I know. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I will anchor the home front. I will be more than happy to take that trip. Not a problem. And was that a yeah. great white? What kind of shark was that with a big old mouth? No, these are lemon sharks. Okay. They look scarier than they are. Like much of a lemon to me. Yeah, these are. These um, are teeth. <laughs> wow! Oh, wow! Oh man! Yeah, so lemon sharks are are the ones that you push out of the way because the tiger shark's in the frame. You know, you want to get the tiger shark. And they're... Um, <laughs> get your ugly mug out of here. <laughs> yeah, but they're... Like a, ah, these beautiful just, sharks. Ah, they're beautiful ah. sharks. And, um, and they, you know, they have these little teeth which are designed for eating fish. So um, they're, they're not coming after us. Um, and I just... I like these shots. I, I'm actually torn about these shots because they, they can be used for evil. You know, they can be used in sensationalist articles. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, for me, they're... It's a celebration of the animal and what, and how incredible they are. You know, they haven't changed very much for hundreds of millions of years, and they just have evolved to be the perfect eating machine underwater. You know, the perfect uh, fish that can survive. You know, all the stuff that we're doing. <laughs> I Man. Mean, until, yeah. Oh Lord, maybe you have to come back and do some more of this. I, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Gonna, he's gonna have to come back. Yeah, you know, <laughs> please, Eric. Not, we're not even. We just crashed. I want to see more. I know. We have so many, but we need to talk about the lytro because yes, okay, we do. Okay, yeah. and the this lytro's is, exciting. The lytro is changing the the world of photography as we speak. I mean, it's not enough that you that you're like saving the world uh, underwater, a shark at a time. Now you're above ground, shaking up the photography industry with Lytro. Yeah, so um, I had never planned on coming back to industry. <laughs> uh, I was having a lot of fun out there and um, really enjoying being in the ocean. Uh, but this, this uh, light field cameras uh, and light field technology really is, is, was too exciting to ignore. You know, it, had, um, it has a lot of potential impact in all of imaging. And um, and for those, I mean, should I give a quick summary of what it is? Or yeah, so yes, 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 yes. Here there's a lot of people that don't really know. Yeah, so I mean, he, here's a picture of the camera. Um, it has a lens, <laughs> uh, but it this is a this is the world's first consumer light field camera, and um, you know we call it that because we're used to the term light field internally. But you know the fact is most people don't know what the light field is, and the light field is. Um, you know, has a very formal definition, which is all of the light traveling in every direction at every point in space. So the light field is 
you know, was theorized hundreds of years ago, or I don't know, maybe formally 150 years ago, um, as how light travels through space. And of course, light is much more complicated than that. Um, but you can think of light in this way, and um, it's the same thing that flows through the lenses in your cameras and then gets burned onto a plate or a sheet of film or a digital sensor. So the light field's coming in, and at every point you get color and luminosity, right? You know, that's what a pixel is. So the, what the light field uh, provides us is much more information than what a light field provides a, a traditional camera. So the key difference is that every, at every point of capture, uh, we record the direction of light as well. So instead of recording a pixel, we're recording a ray. So that's all that pixel information, color, luminosity, and these two vectors that define the angle that the light is traveling through. So basically, we're capturing this multi-dimensional data. You know, we're capturing much more of the light field, and it's very abstract data. You know, it's not really a picture. In fact, digital cameras now don't really capture pictures either, right? Every pixel is red, green, or blue, and it has to be reassembled to be a picture. And so we're carrying that one step further. You know, so we're, carrying, we're now capturing fundamentally different kinds of data. And the first thing we've seen uh, is that we can refocus pictures after the fact. So if you went out and bought a camera today, um, you would get it in two days, which is great, because it was a long waiting list before, and we've reached two-day ship. And, um, and you can take pictures which can be refocused. But you know, we're not a camera that takes pictures that can be refocused. You know, we're actually a camera that captures light fields. And in the long term, um, and long term for us hopefully doesn't mean years, but in, in, the, in months, you know, we'll be releasing uh, updated functionality. So this is very much a living hardware. I mean, we call the pictures we take living pictures, but a light field camera system is, is very much living because, you know, it's as, the software is as important as is the hardware. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've captured the light field. So if we unlock some, something else you can do, like stereo 3D or... Uh, the, you know, some of you might have seen these these talks where we've shown parallax, which is we've shown parallax shifts, perspective shifts. You know, we can change the center of perspective, like move your head back and forth. You know, it changes uh, the perspective of your image. So these sorts of things are are things that we'll, we will roll out as software updates. So you get a software update, all the pictures you've taken in the past get unlocked with these new features. Oh, so wow. you know, I didn't realize that. That's part. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's pretty cool, and I can show you what the camera does now. Yes. Um, yes. And, then, and we can talk about what it will do in the future. Yeah, and you can um, show screen share and show some of the... Yeah, for, first I'll show, I'll show some pictures. Um, where's my little desktop here? One second. Okay, so I always like to show actual pictures I've taken um, of normal life instead of showing uh, you know, our, our demo pictures, for example. Uh, so these, I was in uh, New York last week. We did a a photo walk in Brooklyn uh, at the Brooklyn Flea, which is a ton of fun. And, you know, these are sort of, um, you know, typical pictures that you might take on a photo walk. You know, there's a guy with his Leica. Um, you can refocus on it. Oh, <laughs> All oh my gosh. Awesome. Love this. This technology just, yeah, it's fantastic and phenomenal. Yeah. And you're editing this, this after the fact, or is it coming with its own editing software? And so the, these are visualizations. They're not really editing. This, this, uh, this desktop app comes with the camera, so you install it. And right now, it's, it's the only thing that can process a light field picture. Um, but you can imagine, of course, in the long term, there being a really robust software ecosystem that doesn't just involve Lytro. Um, one of the things that people don't know about this camera is that, other than people who have purchased one and discovered it, is that it's a fantastic macro camera. <gasps> um, so <laughs> you can take pictures of things that are very close to the camera. Um, in fact, it what will focus on earrings? the lens itself. Uh, so you know these sorts of shots of you know detailed shots of accessories are pretty cool. Oh, oh my god! Uh, Kelly would just be like, "I need now." <laughs> so the the thing of it is though that so you got the photograph. But the way to view the photograph is through the software online. So it's not like you could just post the photo on Google Plus. You post a link or something for people to go to this location to see, right, the thing, right? Yes, uh, so, sort of. So in we have um, rudimentary integration with um, 
uh, with Facebook and with Twitter, meaning that if you, if you share one of these pictures in Facebook, it just inlines like a YouTube movie does. So it plays in the timeline, and you can inter anyone can interact with it who's viewing it. You don't need special software. Um, you can just interact with it. So that's pretty cool. And as we, as we roll out new features in our player, of course, that will travel to all these places where we have integration. Now, in Google+, Plus, like we haven't managed to convince Google+, Plus to support our file format yet. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, pretty much no one has, and may, maybe Vimeo being the exception, you know, somehow they're allowed to inline, probably for legacy reasons. Um, but if I wanted to share this picture, for example, I could hit share, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I can say, what can I say? I picture for life through the lens. <laughs> Okay, and what's, what it's doing is uh, uploading not the full 16 megabyte version, but a compressed version for the web, uh, which is kind of, I think it's, you know, depends on the, the data, but it's 400K to just over megabyte. Um, and uh, assuming my connection is good, it'll show up on the website, which I'll show you. Um, and it'll show up on the Lytro website, not necessarily. So on, not, not, not on Facebook. Is that what you did? Yeah, so I'm going to show you what happens on the web. Um, Okay, so here we go. So this is now my, uh, my Lytro account site. And uh, if I refresh it, that picture I just shared uh, appears. And you can, um, you can view it online and interact with it exactly the same way you do in the desktop application. And you'll notice that the default focus position is where I left it in the desktop. Mm -hmm. So oh. if you want to tell a story using oh, focus, cool. you can set the default. Nice. I should, probably should have set it to here, but I wasn't thinking. So now I can share it directly from here using these links. And in fact, I can share it to Google Plus if I wanted. Um, I'll sh do just two really quick uh, demos for sharing. And um, I can just you know, grab the URL, and I can just paste it here. Uh, for example, if I paste it in Facebook, you'll show that it, um, it just inlines. Let me set it only to me. I'll post it. OK. So, oh, I see the little buffer button. Is that for the buffer app? Yeah. That's buffer. specifically for the Lytro. No, buffer is a. It's like a, a delayed posting. It's like do share for Google Plus, oh, but cool. for Facebook, uh, Twitter, gotcha. uh, LinkedIn. Um, oops, hold on a second. Oh, that's embarrassing. It didn't work this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, here I'll show another one. So this one was posted earlier by one of our employees who went to. Metallica in, in <laughs> yeah. Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and so, Whoa. Oh, yeah. Wow. Awesome. Oh. So I, needed, so I needed that this weekend. I was shooting music this weekend. That'd have been fun to play with. So yeah, I have so a question. Just in lines. Uh, and uh huh. When you want to print this, can you say, okay, you know what? Like that one in particular. Okay, I mm -hmm. want the hand in focus, and then you get it printed like that. And then yeah. can you switch it and get the guitar player in focus and then say, see, same picture. I just yep. changed my focus. Absolutely. So you can cool. export JPEGs from the desktop app and they exist exactly how you've left them. <gasps> and you get a, about 1.2 megapixel export as, as a JPEG. Um, and people ask about the resolution all the time. So we export 1080 by 1080. That's our okay. export size. But of course, if you've taken a picture that does not refocus sharply, uh, you still get 1080 by 1080 but it won't be anywhere near that in terms of resolving power. You know? right. So right. yeah, so that, that's just the, the size of the files. Um, I wanted to show you this. Uh, so this is my, my Google Plus page. Now you notice that the, it's live in Google Plus as well. <gasps> oh, oh, wow. so, so cool. The reason I can do this is that I have installed a Chrome, plug, a Chrome oh. extension, which, which I wrote. Boy, um, oh. yeah. Dang, you wrote it too? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So um, it's oh, it's available in the the Chrome store, and it's just um, you know if you if you do a search for you know, I'll just find it really quick. Get more extensions. If you search for Lytro, you'll see these two. There's Lytro Embed for Google Plus, Lytro Embed oh, for Pinterest. Pinterest. Yeah. So if you oh. if you look in, uh, it's funny. This is the thing that got me to use Pinterest. So. I use Pinterest to collect pictures I like, um, and these are Lytro pictures I like. So, you know, here's here's one for example. If I click on it, it embeds the the live uh, Lytro 
oh, picture. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> you know that Calibra Kelby is going to go. Wait, so she's yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, she's gonna be the first spot. You know what I want for my birthday? <laughs> oh wow! Oh man! So, were you finished with what you were gonna show there? Because I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So what's the future of this? What do you? Where is this all going? Like, where do you think? Like, what are we doing here with with Lytro? How is this changing the world? Because I think it is. Um, well, I think it's it's still unclear how it's going to change the world. Honestly, um, I mean, it's a completely new imaging technology, which takes time to mature. Certainly, mm -hmm. uh, this first camera is proof that we can make a light field camera that is totally functional. Um, the people who are really excited about this camera and about the technology are not excited necessarily about this camera. You know, what they're excited about is uh, application in whatever, whatever they can think of. You know, there are lots of verticals who are interested right now in what we're doing. And um, because it's mul this multi-dimensional data, I think, um, you know, we're just scratching the surface of what you can do with light field, uh, with the light with light field data, and so. I think the future in the short term is, of course, you know, more cameras, more features being unlocked via software mm -hmm. so that people can start to really see how powerful the light field is. Um, but also, of course, opening up the ecosystem so that creatives can really start to play in this space. You know, we, we are making tools, um, but people need to be allowed to, um, to use, these, use the pictures that we capture for interesting projects. And those can be you know, projects that are totally practical or artistic, you know, it's, that's not really for us to, to decide. Um, and of course, long term, um, what we'd like to see is ubiquitous adoption of light field in the same way that bitmaps are everywhere now. You know, there's, there's no reason that you can't have a light field engine. It's sort uh, of like developing motion technology, but you're not defining how you're going to use that motion and in what devices and under what conditions. It's just that you develop the technology. There it is. Now go live. Yep, go and, yep. Yeah, and so there, you know, there's some. Uh, there will be some time required, obviously, to get this technology outside of consumer cameras into yeah. uh, more, you know, uh, cameras for specific projects or specific uh, industries. Um, but even within the consumer realm, which is where we're focused, uh, certainly right now, um, you can imagine. Uh, cameras that are, you know, with bigger sensors and much higher resolution and more processing power. I mean, processing power for us is key. And um, one of the things that we like to say is that this, that light field technology has the potential to, um, to change the curve of how cameras improve, you know, and image, all imaging improves, you know, instead of being tied to improving optics, you know, we are now tied to computing. So mm -hmm. the, the power of photography can now hop on onto that Moore's law curve and um, get more powerful as computers get more powerful. So you Basically really... what you have, you, I mean, with Lytro, this is the first real huge shift in photography since the lensed camera. I mean, it's always had a shutter in the beginning. It had a basic aperture, a basic shutter. I mean, beyond the pinhole camera, we've always had a change in film, a change in the recording medium, but this is a huge shift like this is not just a change in a feature. This is a change in the entire um, mechanics. technology, Our architecture of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. It's it's the first. I would say the first fundamental shift. Yeah. You know, certainly, you know, in the history of cameras as they exist today. And this um, is huge. Really. Yeah, huge. certainly huge. And and I think in the short term it will be, uh, and maybe in the long term, you know, it it will be uh, compatible technology in that you you use this for what it's very good at, you know, and that of course changes over time because we're just starting to figure out what you can do with it. I mean, mm -hmm. we're just starting to show people what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And you know, the way I use the camera is very much for what it's good for. I mean, who, was it, was it Tara, were you saying that you'd used one and not had much luck? Oh yeah. Um, I, would, I, I was playing around with, um, with Ricardo's and it took me a little bit to kind of figure out what I was supposed to do because immediately you just want to shoot like you would just with a regular camera, which you kind of have to think beyond that. You have to get out of the, the camera box in a way and see further. So it took me a little bit to kind of get used to it, but yeah, I, it sort I of adds more practice, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, so, you know, what I've realized 
uh, over the course of using these cameras for now a long time, uh, is that they are just fundamentally based in depth of field, you know, and for us photographers, we understand what that means, and I'll bet with one sentence, I could enable you as a light field photographer, you know, but for, for people who aren't photographers, um, you know, there will be uh, much more hand-holding required to, to enable them to shoot effective light field pictures. Some of this stuff will be solved by technology improving in general. You know, faster computers in smaller packages means that, mean that we can do more in the camera and a lot of training and hand-holding can happen in the camera. At the moment, you know, when you look through this viewfinder or look at this LCD, uh, you're seeing a traditional photography world. You know, you're looking out of that lens basically at f2 and you're seeing exactly what the lens sees, or what a traditional sensor would see. Now we're recording a lot more and doing a lot of the processing on the computer after, but if you could do it in camera, of course, that would, that would help a lot. You know, all the things you know when you process the picture. You know, where is the refocus range? You know, where does, where do, where, uh, does sharp refocus stop in the current scene? Mm -hmm. These are all things right now that we push onto you to some extent in the camera. We do refocus on the camera, but mostly when it gets to the computer. Um, so, you know, it, effectively, and you can think of it like this, you know, you can refocus these pictures, but if everything was sharp to begin with, there's nothing to refocus, right? So mm -hmm. if you take a small sensor camera and you take a picture, a landscape shot, and someone's standing six feet away and you're zoomed all the way out, there's, there's no blur in the picture. You know, you have a sharp person, yeah. sharp background. And so you can take that picture with this camera. And in fact, that's what happens if you zoom all the way out and take a picture of someone six feet away, right? Yeah. And so... Um, what you need to do is create shallow depth of field, and with a small sensor camera, you have to exaggerate your compositions, right? You have to get very close or zoom in very far. And so those are the things that photographers immediately realize when they, when they get it with these light field cameras. You know, when you create blur in a composition, uh, if something is sharp and something is blurry, that means when you refocus on the thing that is blurry, the thing that was sharp becomes blurry, you know? So everything's relative. And... Um, and you can take some time to learn that. So, you know, I definitely recommend to people who own these cameras who are not yet successful getting these, these um, you know, very interactive shots to, um, to study depth of field and to, you know, it, to push themselves, you know, push themselves, shoot things so that are that blurry. So that's my thing because I, I shoot a lot depth, uh, short, shallow depth of field. Oh no! Oh no! Uh -oh. She's up. She'll come back. So where? Tell us while she resolves that. Tell us where people can find a Lytro camera and about how much they cost and kind of like you know if they want to enter this world, what does it take? And where do they so do it? You can find Lytro cameras only online right now at Lytro.com. They are uh, three ninety nine and four ninety nine for. Uh, two different capacities. Um, it's sort of the iPhone model of storage. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all internal. Uh, we have a blue, electric blue and graphite versions for $399, which, are, which hold 350 pictures. They're 8 gigabytes. And then this red hot is $499, and it holds 750 pictures. And it's a 16 gigabyte model. And people hook it, connect it to their computer with a, with a standard USB you know, download like a regular camera. Right, so there's a micro USB port in the bottom, mm -hmm. and um, the software that you saw I, that I screen shared out uh, is on the camera itself, and we support both Mac and Windows now. We were Mac only when we when we launched. Um, yeah, and you can you can just get it online, and um, there is a, a budding community uh, that's that's fun because people who get really into this are really into it, mm -hmm. um, and so we actually have a photo contest running right now. At, it's at contest.lytra.com. And it's called Share the Fun. And uh, it's been amazing because people who had been sharing to their own networks, you know, they had, we had no visibility into it unless they share publicly, you know, because we, we search for all tweets with the word Lytro in it and things like that. But if they don't do that, we don't know what they're, you know, we don't know what they're capturing. And we've drawn all these people out and they're all posting their pictures in this contest. And in fact, if you go check it out and you vote there, it requires a Facebook account. Um, there's a there's also a chance that you might win a camera. So, you know, one of the ways you can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can go vote as much as you can. Now, yeah. Eric, um, speaking of the, the you know of you know your fans of the camera and everything, um, Ron had mentioned earlier today about a, um, a photo an astrophotographer who who wants to use Lightro for depth of field in the sense of like not necessarily close depth of field, but for like at his astrophotography like mm -hmm. he says something about there's focusing issues and problems 
Can you give us a little bit of info on that? Yeah, so I, I would probably not recommend this light field camera for astrophotography uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is our output resolution in 2D is, is fairly low. You know, it's just over a megapixel. Uh, so if, if that is useful, you know, you can give it a try. Um, but the other is that uh, a lot of the light field data actually comes, comes from parallax information. And if you're looking at something that far away, all the light is, is parallel, effectively parallel. So we don't have, we just don't have that parallax information unless you put two light cameras, you know, very, very far apart, like across the earth, um, uh, which might be, you know, maybe that's a project he's working on. I don't know. Um, yeah, but I, I would say, you know, we, we do very well when, um, when we have parallax information, that's where all the 3D content comes from. So if you have something very far away, it's basically flat. You know, it's a 2D, it's a 2D sheet out there with a bunch of planets on it or stars. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that's not to say that light field isn't useful for it. I just don't know how it could be useful yet. Yeah, and so it goes along with what you were saying about uh, depth of field and using knowing how to shoot by having objects close and kind of middle and far within a, a much closer range. So it really does shine in that department. But as far as shooting farther objects, um, really you're looking at a flat field. Um, yeah, I mean, if you shoot very, very long focal length, then objects that are very far away do exist at different depths. And we, we do very well in those situations. So if you zoom into 8x, you know, things that are kind of 20, 50, 100, 200 feet away are very distinct. But of yeah. course, if you zoom all the way out, six feet and 100 feet are the same. Yeah. And so um, almost the same. And um, so that makes it hard. So if you had a way to image celestial objects very, very closely with a very, very strong telescope in a way that they actually exist in different planes, I don't even know if that's possible. Um, but if you had a way to do that, then light field could be very useful. So we need to wrap up this portion of the show. I have one more question for you. And then here's what will happen. Those of you that are watching live and that those of you that are in the chat will wrap this portion of the show, which means I will end this broadcast, but I'll start it again. It'll be in my stream. So don't, those of you in the chat, don't go away. And, uh, and we'll do the after show. It'll just be a short little period of time where we have a few more questions that we're not quite getting to in this, uh, in this half of the show. But to wrap this up, Eric, what's next for you? Where's Eric Cheng going with all of this? <laughs> in the short term or long term? <laughs> um, oh. Well, in the short term, you know, we're, we're gearing up for the rest of this year, you know, and we're, of course, uh, very focused on getting these cameras out into the into the wild. Uh, so next month I will be at, at the Luminance conference in New York, which is a photo shelters conference. Uh, I'll be giving a talk there. Uh, and Very that's cool. in kind of mid-September. And then I'll be at Photokina for more talks and hanging out with, you know, camera people. <laughs> um, uh, and then I have a, I ha actually have a dive trip to Indonesia this late November into, um, into December. So it's actually the last trip that was planned before I started Elytra two years ago. So um, I'm, you know, finishing up all those pre-planned trips uh, and really looking forward to that because I've been missing the ocean a lot. That's awesome. Great. Okay, so we have in the after show, we'll be doing a giveaway on one software giveaway. And we all have a few more questions for Eric besides. But for now, for this portion, we want to thank you, Eric Chang. This has been such an illuminating conversation. We're just like agog. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so totally. much. Oh, thank you so much. Phenomenal. Yeah, we really do. So thank we're going to say you. goodbye for this portion, but don't go away because uh, I'll restart the Hangout. We'll do this. We'll continue on and, um, and do the Beyond One Software giveaway. But for now, bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. bye.